recording of the sermon. It was reportedly the dictum of a great American president that, and this will sound familiar to some of you, that you can fool some people, some of the people, all the time. And all the people, some of the time. But you can't fool all the people all the time. Now Jacob learned that lesson the hard way. He, he, might, he might have tricked Esau, his brother, so he could steal his birthright. He deceived his father to get a very important um, fatherly blessing that would make him kind of the chief of, of the tribe when his father would pass away. But because of his trickery, his life was in danger. His brother wanted to murder him. His mom cooked up a scheme to get him to a safe place, which is to Haran, where Uncle Laban, her brother, was staying. Now, she deceived her husband again, um, under the pretenses of finding a, a good wife for Jacob. He blessed Jacob, that is Isaac. He blessed Jacob, and Jacob went off to Haran to find himself a wife or two. Let's pick up the story in Genesis 28, verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. We are going to pause there for a while. After his father had, had blessed him, well, he set out for that place called Haran. Now, it was about an 800 kilometer distance he had to cover. And um, it seems like he did it on foot and, and solo. If, if we go to Genesis 32 verse 10, you, if you want to go there, you can check it up. He prayed to God, and that's Jacob, and he said the following, I had only my stuff when I crossed the Jordan. So it seems like he, he left in a real hurry that his brother Esau really was looking for him. Now we have to remind something about remind ourselves that Jacob was not really the rough it up in the wild type. Jacob was more the stay at home type. He was not the hunting type, he didn't like outdoors, he was not the macho man like his brother Esau was. He would rather sit in his tent and manage his farm from the comforts of the shadows of his tent. Hunting was not his main thing. Sleeping under the stars, definitely not, definitely not roughing it up in the wild. So Jacob in the felt was totally out of his comfort zone. There's another thing we have to remind ourselves. On such a journey that he was on, you would travel by day, but you, you would plan your, your travels well because you would like to end up at a town before dark or at a well before dark so that you can sleep in safety. And, and the towns in those days when it got dark they, and cities, they shut their gates to keep the animals out and dangerous people out and so on. So that was what, what Jacob did. He traveled by day, but it seemed like he misjudged him a bit. The town that he was setting out for was called the town Luz. We will read of it a little bit later. And I will explain to you what, what that means then. But he didn't make it. And the gates were shut before he got there. So he had to settle where he was in the wild for the night. He had to find a place where he could sleep safely. Now, take note, he was not looking around to, to find some kind of holy place. The only thing on his mind at that point in time was safety, survival, to make it to Iran, and maybe that night he, he built himself a little fire and he, he sat by the fire and thought of the things he did. Maybe some guilt, felt some guilt about the way he treated his father and his brother. Well, he definitely had a lot to think about. And he might have wondered about 
the reception is going to get at Uncle Laban, you know, what kind of wife would there be for him? Would he ever come home again? His father's words before he left Beersheba provided little comfort for him at that point in time. His father told him, Jacob, this is the blessing of, that God gave to Abraham. I, I, and and it's, it applies to you. That I pray that the Lord will bless you. I pray that the Lord will give you land. I pray that the Lord will give you many descendants. But I think at that point in time, Jacob sitting there by his fire that night, tired alone, those words were furthest from his mind. Those were mere words to him. Now we know, but Jacob didn't, that it was by God's providence that he did not make it to that town called Luz, but which was just where Bethel was. Bethel was just outside Luz. Now by God's design, he ended up in maybe, or definitely, the most important place in his life. Without realizing it. Exhausted, uncertain, full of fear for the future, alone in the wilderness. He arranged the place, place on the ground to sleep for the night. In verse 11 we read, taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. Those were the kind of pillows they had those days. And they did it. And he drifted off in a strange dream. Verse 12. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching the heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it, in some translations beside him, stood the Lord. I'm going to camp for a while on this, Andrew, so I'll, I'll tell you when we move on from verse 13. Now the Hebrew language that is used here captures Jacob's fear and shock of this divine revelation well. He never had such a thing in his life. If I, if I take the, the, the Hebrew directly into English, it's, it's short Three, four words at a time. Staccato. It sounds, might have sounded like this. There a stairway. Oh, angels going up. Coming down and look. The Lord himself. It's written like that. Now, in, in that vision, Jacob saw a stairway. Most commentators connect that, that staircase, the word that is used there with a, with a kind of temple towers they had in the ancient world where there was a central staircase going up to the top and the idea was that the, the God was at the top so you want to meet the God you go up the stairway could have been a, a, a pyramid shaped like um, which, which was called a ziggurat pyramid shaped like temple with staircases on the sides leading up to the top where the God supposedly dwelt. And sometimes they would even paint that part blue to make the distinction between heaven and the earth you know, less. Literally, the ancients saw such structures as gateways to the gods. A gateway to heaven, which is what Jacob called it later on. What it was, we, we exactly was, we won't, we won't know. What is important that we cannot miss is that in that vision, Jacob looked up and saw the Lord, not at the top, <coughs> with him. That was what was totally different from the pagan mindsets in those days. You go up and you meet the God there. Here David had a vision of God being with him. God had come down to Jacob. He was not unreachable there at the top someplace, like the so-called pagan gods. No, the Lord stooped down from heaven to speak to a sinner like Jacob. And it was not as if Jacob had prayed and fasted through the night. His eat, pray, love moment. To meet with God. It was not as if he was going up a mountain to get a word from God. <laughs> I think God was a very distant thought 
in his mind at that point in his life. We, we find no words of any spiritual significance spoken by Jacob up to then. In fact, the only time he referred to God up to that point in his life was when he called God as a witness to the lie that he was telling his father. So in fact, blaspheming. What we have here is the God of grace taking divine initiative to reveal himself and his will to Jacob. Jacob had done nothing to deserve that honor. Just the opposite. His sinful actions deserved severe rejection and punishment from God. Jacob had not been looking for God. He was out there to try and save himself, to get to a safe place with Uncle Laban. Yet, God stooped down to that miserable sinner and revealed himself to him. Jacob was a runaway thief and a cheat, yet God found him. What would God say to him? Knowing who Jacob is, what he did, one pastor imagined a a response like this. That was a response that Jacob deserved, but I'm going to quote him. His name is Jeff Thomas. What would God say to him? Quote, maybe something like this. I've had my eye on you, Jacob, you know, and the angels have been coming back to me reporting on all your shenanigans. How could you behave like that? My friend Abraham's grandson, cheating and lying and blaspheming. Why didn't you talk to me before all that stupidity? Why didn't you put some brakes on your mother's wild schemes? Look at the trouble you got yourself into. And he would have deserved that. But Jacob heard just the opposite. Words of mercy, words of grace, and words of divine promise. From God, the promise giver himself. Verse 13 to 15. Andrew. This is what God said to him. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised you. God was telling Jacob, Jacob, that promise you heard your grandfather repeating so many times. I mean, Jacob, um, Abraham died when Jacob was about 15 years old. So in his teenage years, he knew knew his grandfather Abraham. That promise, Jacob, that that your grandfather told you when when you were sitting around the fire of, of God, giving him this promise of land and descendants. And and you know what, Jacob, that voice that your dad heard on Mount Moriah, that day when, when Abraham, your grandfather, wanted to sacrifice Isaac, that was me. I am the Lord, the God, who spoke to your father Abraham, your grandfather Abraham and your father Isaac. I am the one who gave that promise. I am the Lord that called your granddad out of Ur. That was me. And what I have promised them, I confirm to you now. You will have, you will have this land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be many, uncountable like the dust of the earth. All the peoples will be blessed through you and your offspring. And God knew what The need of Jacob's soul was at that moment. He knew the difficulties that Jacob would face once he get to Uncle Laban, who deceived him for quite a few years. 
So God assured Jacob, Jacob, in all of this, I will be with you. I will protect you. I will care for you. I will provide for you on this journey till all my promises are fulfilled in you. Imagine Jacob there, full of fear, uncertainty, not knowing what's going to happen. God speaking these words of mercy and grace and promise to him. God confirming to Jacob that the promises he had made to Abraham and Isaac would now rest on him and would continue through him and that God would make sure that everything he promised would come true, would come to pass in Jacob. I mean, I'm sure Jacob had heard these promises many times before, as I said, (coughs) through his granddad and his dad. But up to that point, it had little impact on him. But that night, for the first time in his life, it became real to him. And it meant life to him. Why? The same reason that People can come to church for 20 years and heard nothing. But then one day, God spoke to your soul. And you woke up and you heard Him speak through His Word and His living Word, Jesus Christ. Why? Because God revealed Himself to you. And that was the same with Jacob. Why could Jacob hear that promise for the first time so loud, with such reality in his life, that night? Because of the one who spoke those words. Because God revealed Himself and said these things to Jacob in person. He had met the God of the promise. Now I want us to stand back a bit. Let, let's take a pit stop here. Because this is huge. When, when we drive, our, my family, when we drive somewhere, we, we sometimes stop at, at these little chairs, and cement chairs and tables that you have along the road. In Afrikaans, we, we simply call them tafelkin stulki. We, we do a tafelkin stulki moment. Tafelki is table and stulki is chair. For those who, who do not understand Afrikaans. So let's let's take a Tafelki Stulki moment here. Let's stop and, and pause a bit. My brother and sister, if God do not come down into your soul and make it alive to see him and hear his words, your soul will be as dead and deaf as the stone Jacob slept on that night. In the New Testament, we call that moment rebirth. God gives life. And that night outside the town of Luz, which uh, Jacob later on called Bethel, in the wilderness, Jacob's spiritual eyes and ears were opened by God. You, You can build as many ladders as you like to find God. But unless God does not reveal himself to you, you will not Finding. Meeting God does not depend on human skill or effort. What we see here in picture form with Jacob is what needs to happen. God must come down and meet with you. Reveal himself to you and his salvation through his son Jesus Christ to you. God came down to meet with Jacob that night. God came down. That ladder was not Jacob's ladder. It was God's. And He alone can make a way for you to be with Him. To meet Him and know Him and trust in Him. It's not a case of you going up to Him. 
but of Him coming down to you, a sinner, in grace and mercy, and reveal Himself and His salvation in Jesus Christ, His Son who died for your sins, to your soul. To open your eyes to the real ladder to Him. Called Jesus Christ. Didn't Jesus say, no one come to the Father except through me? Didn't Jesus say, I am the way and the truth and the life to the Father? Didn't Jesus say, the gate through whom his sheep can enter his eternal kingdom was himself? He is the way. Through his death and resurrection, he paid the price for the sins of scoundrels like Jacob and you and me. So that when we put our faith in him, in Jesus, the way, the gate, we are reckoned righteous and fully paid up for our sins in the sight of God. And we can enter into his kingdom through Jesus Christ. He is that way. And and people cannot work their way to God. Build their own way to God by good works or manipulating God or bribing God to get right with Him or using some miraculous oil here or there or being knocked over by some kind of false prophet here and there. My dear brother and sister, every other religion and even some that call themselves Christian is built on that human effort principle. And that is why they are called false religions. The human efforts will lead its worshippers to hell. Unless, unless God takes the first step and provides a way for you to be with Him through faith. You and I will stay in the dirt at the bottom of our stairway, lost in darkness. Unless God moves like Jacob, moves us from a Beersheba to a Bethel, we will sleep and slumber away into eternal death. What was waiting for Jacob in Beersheba? Death. That was where he cheated his father and his brother. That was where his brother promised that he would kill him. What happened in Bethel? God moved him there by his providence. And God met him and saved him from death to life. From Beersheba, where sin prevailed, to Bethel, where God met this lost sinner and revealed himself to him. We are still at the Tafel Kings Tuki. And the question is, where are you at this point on your journey? Where are you at this point in your life? Beersheba or Bethel? Have God met up with you in Bethel yet? Took away your spiritual darkness now? Darkness opened your eyes to his grace and his mercy and his promises, opened heaven's gates, so to speak, like that one song goes, and moved you by faith to put your trust in his son, Jesus Christ, his way for salvation and eternal security. Security. Have you met with the living God in your Bethel yet? And if you say, yes, yes I have, what was your response? And what is your response still today? Let's go to verse 16 to 19 and see what Jacob's response was. We can pick up a few things there. Verse 16. When Jacob woke up, obviously he was full of awe, but but also terrified. God came down to speak with him. God came from heaven to speak with him. Verse 16. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. 
He was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. It was just outside of Luz. Luz means almond. So, guess what? what was there a lot of in the city of Luz? But listen to Jacob. Up to that point, he had never sought God's guidance. We have no reference of that. Up to that point, he did not obey God much. In fact, he did the opposite. He cheated, he schemed, he lied. He was very selfish, selfish throughout his life. Tried to get things his way, to his advantage. I don't think he ever even prayed to God up to that point in time. And there, that night, at that place... God spoke to him. What a special event. An event that needs to be marked. An event that needs to be remembered. So David took the stone he had placed horizontally under his head to sleep on and set it up vertically as a pillar, kind of a mini ladder. Symbolically, he was living horizontally. God opened his eyes. Now everything is about God. That was a monument marking the place where God appeared to him. Setting that stone up as a witness to the God who spoke to him there. A God who gave him all those promises. And he marked that stone. He poured some oil on top of it. That was the kind of consecrating the, the stone. Setting it apart from the rest. That, that oil would stain the stone. That stone would look totally different from that point onwards. He, that stone was set apart from all the other ordinary stones in that place as a reminder to Jacob that that was the place where God met with him and gave him a way to him through himself, by meeting with him himself. Which is why I called that, that place Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. And maybe with some pagan influences still in his mind, he called it the gate of heaven. Now, how does a heart that has been awakened by God like that, a soul that has met with a living God like that, respond to such sovereign grace? Let's listen to Jacob's response, verse 20 to 22. Genesis 28, verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow. Well, he was the only patriarch who made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking, I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. Remember that. And this stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you've give me, you give me, I will give you a tenth. If God opened your eyes to Jesus Christ as your Savior, as the only way to have a right standing with God through faith in Him, as the only way to heaven and having eternal life, there is but one response. A total giving over. A total giving up of, of giving up of self, a total reliance and commitment and trust and faith in Jesus. A total consecration, like, like that of Thomas, doubting Thomas when, when he realized that the man whose hands he was piercing with his fingers was indeed Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What did he say? My Lord and my God. My Lord, I'm yours. You are, I'm owned by you. And my God, you alone to be worshipped. That was his profession of faith. Jacob's profession of faith, of faith was this. Lord, since you've promised to, to be with me, and the Lord did that earlier on when, in that vision. Lord, since you've promised to be with me, and, and since you've promised to watch over me on this journey, and provide me with, with the necessities of life even, and even promised me that you would bring me safely back to my father's house, 
those important words. You are my God. You alone are my God. Meaning, I will serve no other. I'm nobody else's. I belong to you. I'm yours. You are my God. If this message found you today still in a place called Beersheba in your life, this is the response when your eyes have been opened by God to see Him and His salvation in Jesus Christ. When you go home and you want to talk to God because of this message, you can say, Lord, You are my God. That's the response. I will serve no other. I am yours. I belong to you. That was Jacob committing himself to God. He came to understand that the chief blessing was not land and descendants and security and significance. No, it was God himself. He did not say, oh, thank you, Lord, for that wonderful promise and nice bank account. I can have all these things. Thank you, Lord, for that. What did he say? No, you are my God. That was what he had to see. The most important thing that Jacob had to realize was that God was his God. And he would be with him from that moment on in a very special way in his life. And that the only true response to such revelation is total consecration, total trust, total total faith in God. Giving all to God. Committing all to this Awesome, gracious, merciful God who came down to speak to a sinner like Jacob and opened his eyes to see life. That part where Jacob said, all that you give me, I will give you a tenth, that is just symbolic of the fact that everything he had and is belonged to God. Anyway, giving to God a tenth like that was an act of faith. It showed that he trusted in God to provide. He had nothing, he only had his stuff at that point in time. But it also was an acknowledgement of God's provision and care. An acknowledgement that all he had belongs to God. Anyway, that he's God's now. You are my God and I'm yours. This was Jacob bowing the knee in faith to God. It was my Lord and my God moment for Jacob. But, we are at the next tafel king's talking. Let's stand back a bit and think about this again. God's revelation through his word, through a sermon like this, Through Jesus Christ, the living word begs a response. Like Jacob, we must respond to God who has revealed himself to us in Jesus. Now for Jacob, that that meant a voluntary vow of commitment and loyalty in the form of a monument that he put up, that stone, and the tithe that he promised the Lord. But that is the effect, sovereign grace should have on you a total worship of God and a total commitment and faith in God as your Lord who owns you. A new heart who has been changed and made alive to God will see that day that that happened, that sovereign Bethel moment as the most important event in his life. I preached in the old age home on Tuesday morning. I started the sermon with this question. What would you say is the most important event in your life? And there was not even one second that passed when an old uncle shouted out, the day I was saved. That's it. You will want to erect a stone in your life to remember that. That's why some of you have dates written in your Bibles of that important day. To remind you of that day. 
the day that God made you new and he became your God and you his child. That was Jacob's response. And my prayer is that you will respond as he did. My prayer is that each one of us will ask ourselves, where am I on this journey? In Beersheba, where sure death is waiting, in my sins, lost in darkness, dirty, or have God revealed his salvation to me in his son Jesus Christ? And I've responded with, you are my God, and I am yours. There's no in-between here. Some people would think, oh, you know, the Lord is busy with me. I'm somewhere here in between. My dear brothers and sisters, there is no in-between. You might think you are there, but you still have the dust of Beersheba on your clothes. Until you've met with Jesus Christ, you are not clean. You are not right with God. Where are you? Where does this message find you today in your life? Still dwelling in Beersheba? Or have the living God made you alive and new in your Bethel moment? Can you say, my Lord and my God, you are my God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for this wonderful morning. Thank you, Lord, that once again you have given us, in a real life form, the way that we can be yours. And that is that you in grace come down, and that come down physically in Jesus Christ. To die for a sinner like me. Made me new. Let me put my faith in Jesus. So that I. Can be right with you. Oh Father I pray that this message will. Get stuck in every heart here today. Please let the seed that have been planted. Let it grow and bring a wonderful, wonderful fruit of the Holy Spirit in that life. This is something you do, Lord. We cannot. And we trust you for that. Please be with everyone here today. I pray, Lord, and thank you for this wonderful day that we can also thank you for one of the great blessings in our lives, and that's to have mothers. We praise you for them and we ask, Lord, that you will work your wonderful ways in their lives as they too will be wonderful testimonies of your mercy and your grace to young ones in our church. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.